I'm not by trade a nonfiction writer. I'm a novelist. And um, when shortly after Adam Ross took over the Swanee Review, he got in touch with me because my third novel had come out about a marriage in crisis. Um, And he got in touch with me because he liked the book and he was asking if I wanted to write a story for the Swanee Review. And the timing of his phone call was like within days of me having seen a lawyer. (laughs) And so our, I think it took five minutes for our phone call to move away from marriage in crisis in fiction to marriage in crisis in real life. And by the end of that talk, which ended up lasting several hours, um, he had talked me into writing an essay about the dissolution of my marriage and the way I found out the sort of dramatic, my books coming out and my ex-husband's having an affair with my former best friend. And he just, he loved this idea of um, art and life mimicking one another. And I wrote him so many drafts of this essay. I mean, like, bless Adam for being my therapist for, for a little while. And there were probably four or five drafts where I'd get a phone call sometimes late at night and he'd be like, Hannah, really great, really great that you got this out of your system. <laughs> let's, let's go literary, right? Let's, let's go literary because these were early drafts where I was like, and then Trish did this. And one time she said that <laughs> and he's like, right. Yes, this happened. And I affirm it. I want the other story. So because of Adam, I think I, I ended up with a really beautiful piece of literary creative nonfiction. And it was undeniably therapeutic and, and, and awesome to write and to have him as an editor in the background. But when I was going around about a year later, two years later, promoting my fourth novel, um, which I I don't love because I finished it after the divorce. And I think like all of my passion was gone. Like all I just it was like I, I wrote Lee finished the book. Like I got the words in. I didn't make the first deadline, but I made the second deadline and the book was done. And it just like sucks anyway. Um, so I'm going around promoting that book. And during every q and I'm not exaggerating, every q and there would be one person at least in the audience who would raise their hand and they'd be like, I read this essay. I don't know where I read it. And it was, did your husband have an affair with your best friend? And then once that first person asks a question, suddenly every, and I was telling the story all the time. So um, I just found myself for the two or three, four years after the divorce, that's what people wanted to talk to me about. That's what my realtor wants to talk to me about. And I think like the mercenary in me one day was like, well, if I'm going to keep telling the story, (laughs) I might as well try to make money off it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Got to monetize this. Kind of. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So th- I don't even know if I'm still answering your question. No, I get it. I mean, it's like the ultimate betrayal. or It's like one of the ultimate betrayals to have your best friend have an affair with your husband is a lot. And it also is the makings of a good story. But at least on a certain level and from a certain perspective. But I think that it's, it strikes me as the kind of experience emotionally and psychologically that for somebody who is a writer, how could you not deal with it on the page? I mean, unless you just did heavy therapy, but it just seems like such a, na- eventually you're going to have to tackle this. Like how could you write anything but this? I had an experience like this, so I'm sort of projecting it onto you, but it feels like when big things like this happen to writers, what else are you going to do? Every, everything in my life that has been traumatic or difficult has at some point or another become material for either a short story or a novel. So I am... I'm so used to cannibalizing my own life. And when I got to this particular event, this betrayal, um, 
there wasn't a doubt in my mind that I was going to write about it. In fact, I mean, I think like one of my greatest fears because everyone involved is a writer was that one of them would get to it before I did. And I totally assume, by the way, it's fair game, right? They're both going to write about it or they can, they don't need my permission. Um, but I felt like there was this race right after it happened to, to get it on page. And I tried to write it as a novel. I tried from all three perspectives. I tried multiple perspectives, hers, his, and it just kept falling flat. And every, every time I would go back to something I'd written when it was, when I was fictionalizing it, it just didn't have the kind of, it didn't have the weight of truth that, all the other fiction I've written had to me. I wasn't like exposing any human experience. And I think I just, I knew I had to write about it. And then, you know, one day during the pandemic, um, early in the pandemic, I just came up here to my attic and started writing down the conversations. It was like literally like vomiting out the conversations that I was stuck with that were just echoing, echoing, echoing. And getting those initial conversations on the page is where this project started. Hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And the, the path, like this circuitous path that you take where you're kind of writing away and writing around the real story, which is the story within you from your perspective. And in particular, these voices in your head, these converse, these remembered conversations. It takes a while to get there. And you talk about the emotional truth of the thing not being there as it was in previous works of fiction. And you also, can, as you say, cannibalized life experiences of your own in previous works of fiction. And yet, for this particular story, that didn't work. There was no emotional truth that you could get to through fiction that you could find. Do you know why? Was it just because this was so big and so painful? I think so. Something I'm always telling my students, um, especially early, early writers, there's this desire to have, and we're, you know, I'm a, I love nuance. I love nuance. And it's like nuance is dead. Um, and what I love about, my students is that they are young and that the world is still, you know, it's not been flattened like Cormac McCarthy's men, you know, time flattens a man. Um, life is still just like teeming with like, it's all up or it's all down, it's all in or it's all out. And I love that about them because they're just filled with this like youthful passion that you can't even appreciate while you have it. But they're also kind of infuriating because when they write a villain. The villain is often, at least in an early draft, super one-dimensional, like Cruella de Vil. Hates children, kicks dogs, kills puppies, right? Like there's nothing redeeming about the evil person. And what I'm always trying to tell them is nobody, nobody is all bad or in, in fiction. And specifically, I'm talking about fiction. Um, you have to give everybody something that they love, every character, even, even who you think is the most vile, if you want your reader to begin to understand them. So like, you've got a stepmother, right? And she hates her stepdaughter. And like, she's wicked to everyone. And she cheats on the father. Like, that's all great. But like, have her on Saturday morning, wake up and feed the orphans, right? Like have her have a fetish for picking up turtles from the middle of the road and always like daintily moving them to, you know, off the road. Give us something that shows that there is complexity because everyone is complex. Um, I don't think I was able to imbue when I was writing my ex and my friend as fictional characters, somehow I could not imbue them with humanity. And that felt wrong, but I couldn't do it. Like I was not able to accurately and adequately make it up. And it just felt gross when I would look at it. And then when I started writing it, I was like, well, this is my version. 
and this, but this feels true. And I was able, I think, to like fill them in. Yeah. It's like truth is stranger than fiction, maybe in this case. <laughs> I think so. It, it, yeah. And this, it's certainly as, as a real story, I think there's a lot more at stake than this is just another story of like if it were fiction and if I'd wanted to market it as a novel, I feel like my publicity team in order to make it um, remotely interesting would have to sort of do a whisper campaign. It's a novel, but not really. It's right. based on her life. Right. And, right. and I had, you know, I have conversations all the time in my head with everybody real and imagined as this book might suggest. And I imagined like, the campaign that would have to occur to make the fictional version even remotely interesting. And then I was like, well, I guess this one time I can like just tell the truth. Kind of. Kind of. Yeah. Kind of. Right. And so let's have you just like as an example so that listeners can get a taste of how you portray uh, one of the villains in this book is the scene where you are out with Trish getting a drink and Trish is your former best friend who had an affair with your ex-husband. And Trish is on the page. I think we were joking about this before we came online. Like a great character. It just so happens that she's a real human being who horribly betrayed you. But as rendered on the page, there's a certain charisma and what, what's the word for it? Something kind of off the wall about her. And I think you should just read it and people can get a sense. May 2007, Hannah and Trish get a drink. A fancy fish place on the downtown mall in Charlottesville, Hannah and Trish both have on outfits. Trish always has on an outfit, right? But this time Hannah and Trish both have on. That's me as an aside, the author breaking through fourth wall. Trish, let's stay alone at the bar a minute longer. Hannah, they found a table though. I can see them. They're waving us over. Trish, it's okay. They'll still be there. You don't have to be available to Patrick all the time just because you're dating now. Distance is good. Hannah, I'm not available to him all the time. Trish, look at them watching us. They really love us. Oh my gosh, that's so cute. You're blushing. Hannah, it's the gin. Trish, take a sip. How's the sex? Hannah, wow, straight to that. Trish, Sir, excuse me, could you watch your elbow? I'm drinking a martini with my girlfriend here and your elbow keeps knocking into mine. Sorry, H, what were we talking about? Oh, right, sex. I don't actually like sex. Have I ever told you that? There's so much I want to tell you all of a sudden. I don't know. Now that you're with Patrick, things just feel different. You're different. Everything is how it should be. We can double date always and we'll be a perfect foursome. I've been waiting for this. I knew once you'd hooked up, you'd finally get together. Just because it took Patrick a minute to be convinced he was into you doesn't mean he doesn't love you already. Hannah, you don't like sex? With George? Trish, with anyone. I like making out. George is the best kisser. Sex is just bleh. Hannah, do you have orgasms? Trish, you don't have to whisper. Hannah, I'm not whispering. I'm just being a little quiet. This place is a lot busier than it usually is. Trish, because of basketball, there's a home game. Hannah, oh, Trish, of course I have orgas orgasms, self-inflicted orgasms alone at home. Hannah, huh, Trish, you have orgasms? Hannah, yes, Trish, with Patrick? Hannah, yes, Trish, cool, weird, I'm surprised. Hannah, why are you surprised? Trish, you had sex with my brother, remember? Hannah, meaning? Trish, nothing, nothing, sir. Excuse me, can you please not push your girlfriend's purse into my space? There's a hook under the bar. You're not supposed to put purses on bars. Ugh, sorry, H. I didn't mean to keep interrupting you. But seriously, bar etiquette 101, no purses on bars. Am I right? Hannah, you're being kind of loud. Trish, I don't care if they hear me. I want them to hear me. I've been jabbed in the back 10 times by this guy. Frankly, he should buy me a drink after how much I've spilled. Hannah, did your brother tell you about the sex we had? We were both pretty drunk. Trish. No, no. Yuck. I don't talk to my brother about sex. Hannah. You guys are close. Trish. Does Patrick know about my brother? Hannah. Are you already drunk? You're kind of acting like you do when you're drunk. Trish. I'm not drunk. Hannah. 
Patrick knows about your brother. I mean, it happened months ago, before we started dating, so it doesn't even matter. But yes, I told him about it at the time. We talk about sex. We've always talked about sex. Trish, that'll change. Hannah, we should join them. Trish, let's finish these drinks first. We'll spill them if we try to walk over there. Hannah, you're the one who taught me never to order a drink I couldn't walk away from. Trish, beer. Never order a beer you can't walk away from. This is a martini. This is expensive. Let's finish these and then go over. Oh my God. Look at Patrick. Look at him looking at you. He looks so dumb right now. Hey, Patrick. Hannah, shh. Trish, hey, Patrick. Hannah, put your hand down, please. Trish, Patrick, did you know that Hannah had sex with my brother? Hannah, what are you doing? Trish, Patrick, did you know that your girlfriend had sex with my brother? Hannah, why are you being like this? Trish, because it's funny. Because it's fun. Stop being so glum all the time. Now I'm bored. I remember that like it was yesterday, Brad. Uh, yeah, I mean, and the Fucking thing about full it, bar, right? a full bar. <laughs> and it's funny. <laughs> it is. I mean, I know it's painful and like awkward, but it's like funny on the page. I don't know how funny it was in real life, but there's something funny about it and something funny about her. It just so happens that she also betrayed you and it's like amoral or some some part of her is amoral and like just detached. Yeah, detached, right? Like, but but what I love about that scene, and this is what I mean, like imbuing a character, okay, maybe not humanity in that scene, but I did learn from her, don't put a purse on a bar table, like on top of a bar top. Like, and that's actually a really good lesson, you know, because it spills other people's drinks. And I loved the way that she would actually say to a dude, like, stop jabbing me, man. Like, you're you're actually jabbing me. I I loved that about her, you know, and she really did teach me never to order a drink. You can't walk away from like, if you're in a bad situation, if you're in a like stupid conversation, you can always leave. And so I wanted to show that and to show like how much I was still in the throes of her kind of charm while also showing like, who the fuck does that? But then for me, who the fuck takes it? Like, what? What? Right. I wish I could go back and like shake me by the shoulders and be like, <laughs> this is your best friend. Right. What's wrong and, with you? Right. Right. And just so people have a little bit of backstory, Trish, as she is named in the book, is somebody that you met in grad school at UVA. Yeah. So this was like an MFA friend? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And something that you get to in the book, I mean, you just touched on it, but it's worth noting like this was not just like a friend who bullied you or like kind of humiliated you lightly <laughs> um, before this betrayal. This is a friend who also helped you with grief, get through tough times, get through some loss that you had experienced in your life and uh, maybe helped you socially. I could imagine a friend like this might help you if you're a little bit more on the shy side when you go into a party with somebody like that or into a social situation, she just kind of takes over, right? More than any romantic partner I've ever had, this was the woman who, yeah, at a party, like I turn bright red, I have a hard time with eye contact, um, like I, I need a drink in my hands kind of immediately. Um, and, you know, I fret about it what am I going to say leading up to the whole thing? Like it, it, parties are just disasters, especially in grad school when I was like, I think I'm a pretty outgoing person or at least I perform being a, a pretty outgoing person. But in grad school, I was not performing that. I was just like in a, like in a corner quietly, you know, maybe even crying. Like I could cry at a party if somebody came up and tried to talk to me and be nice to me, like definitely waterworks. Um, and she, if she ever dragged me to a party, she was not like some boyfriend who would get there, see his buddies and be like, you're good, right? Um, she would just like have her hand on me, like making sure that I was always comfortable. And if she ever got a suspicion or a whiff that I wanted to leave, she'd turn and be like, you and me, bar, next scene, we're out of here. So yes, socially, that was a tension like I had never seen. And it helped. Like, she's beautiful, you know? Um, she's charming. Men loved her. And and that meant, 
you know, I got attention, which was brand new to me. And I, it was just, yeah, it was addictive. And on top of that, um, she, she had known some grief early on. She'd lost a parent. And when my adoptive stepfather was diagnosed while we were both in graduate school, um, you know, people who get grief and, and I know, I know, I know that you've written and you, I know that you know what I'm talking about here. Um, it's amazing to have a friend who, if you start crying or if you get quiet, isn't like, are you okay? Or, or, you know how, like, they forget how to talk to you. Uh, like, like with your son, there are friends who don't know how to, um, look you in the eyes. So they get all like weird and cagey and they're looking over your shoulder instead of just being like, man, it's hard this week. Right. Like how is anything like that? And she would just, again, put like a hand on my thigh and be like, go home. It's okay. You don't have to explain anything. Just go home. Or do you want to get out of here? And not having grief be like this gross thing that you might catch, which I felt like some of my other friends who are in their twenties and just fortunately for them hadn't yet experienced it. And therefore I felt like they felt like I was contagious somehow and like smelled bad. She just didn't, she didn't smell it. You know, it wasn't contagious to her. She'd already been through it. And that was awesome. Yeah. So it's kind of, but like what comes to mind is like, it's complicated. <laughs> This friendship yeah. and this yeah. portrayal of this human being, like human beings always, you talk about nuance. That's right. that's it right there. This is somebody who's capable of great compassion and understanding and sensitivity to your emotional situation and yet is also capable of having an affair with your husband. <laughs> I mean, like you know, that's... one of the one of the reasons that I have all those little one liners in there about how she always has an outfit on when my husband and I were divorcing. I was not in touch with her at all. I couldn't, I couldn't deal with that. That, that was like more, more difficult in some ways. But when we were divorcing, we had to see each other. He had to get his stuff out of the house. There were just all of those interactions, the uncoupling that has to occur. And occasionally he would make the mistake of wanting to tell me something that she'd said, you know, well, she said this about you. She said this, and it would just drive me crazy to know like even imagine them talking about me. Um, but one time he told me that Trish said to him, one of her complaints about me was that in all the years that we've been friends and that she'd taken me out and she'd given me compliments, I had never once complimented her clothing. And I can't quite forget that because I always thought she looked great. I was always like jealous of how great she looked and her kind of instinct to just be like a little bit weird and a little bit sexy and like a little bit like crazy, homeless, cool girl. Like, um, and I so admired it. And when my husband told me that that was something that had always bothered her, it was a real moment of like introspection for me. Cause I was like, oh shit. <laughs> I might not have ever complimented her, but I meant like, I always thought it, but I guess perhaps my own jealousy kept me from saying it. And so now like with my, with all of my friends, people I've just met, like I try to get a compliment out there. First thing, like, I love your red shirt, Brad. I was going <laughs> to say, yeah, like, that was why you were effusively complimenting my t-shirt. I love it. <laughs> yeah. It's really, I really like wonderful. your, your earphones. Yes. I know. I could see how that would work. I mean, I could see how like as a corrective, like you would just have to impulsively compliment people, but it's, uh, it's pretty, what's the word for it? It's pretty amazing. Like the multitudes that people contain. And it's also amazing how complex things can get interpersonally and how much can be living subsurface and you just have no idea something like that like this person who is secretly pining for a compliment that you're not giving even though you're thinking it and you have no idea until somebody tells you and i think it's worth noting for listeners who might not have had the chance to read yet it's important to know that you know hannah you and trish are like best friends and you're married to patrick uh 
Trish is married to George, right? Mm -hmm. They're married? Yeah. Yeah. And like the four of you are buddies. Like the whole group is intimate. It's not just, yeah, it's not like you and Trish are buddies and she has these like passing interactions with Patrick. It's like you guys are always intermixing and socializing and doing stuff. And and it's a very like charged foursome, right? Friendship. Yeah. And we we all had... um literary ambitions and yeah they were the couple that we traveled for right we we went to see them wherever they were living they came to see us um and you know in retrospect like duh right duh that this happened and if if it hadn't happened when it did happen um i think especially the longer couples stay together the more the more vulnerable they can become. They don't have to become, but with with us, all of us, we also, none of us had, had children. Um, so there's that kind of, I think, I think that when there's a child in your life, there are certain risks that you might still be willing to take, but you're aware of like what a big risk it is as opposed to, when there's not a child in your life, you're like, you know, it's just like maybe a little bit easier. And and I say that as somebody who has a stepdaughter in my life. So I don't, I still don't like, I am, I've never grown one um, out of me, but I, I have a stepdaughter and she definitely affects how I think of um, my movement, my movement through the world. Like there's a Absolutely. new responsibility. Absolutely. I mean, it's going to impact her. It's going to, I mean, when you have kids, it's like, it's a, it's an additional level of responsibility, right? Yeah. Whether it's yours biologically or it's a stepchild, somebody you're helping to raise and are around a lot, you would have to be pretty detached to not recognize the impact that your thoughts, your actions and speech are going to have on that person. Yeah. Right? Yeah. (laughs) So... <clears throat> I want to ask you about the emotional process. We've talked a little bit about the creative process of getting to this book in its final form and how you had to kind of try the fiction first and then eventually surrender to the nonfiction. But because there is such emotional intensity, I have to believe, uh, attached to experiencing something like this, it, it's not an easy place to write from always. I guess sometimes people are like super hot emotionally and like a book just sort of flies out of them, you know, because they're so charged up. But in my experience anyway, I feel like the emotional stuff can sometimes be, it can have like a clouding effect and it can make it hard to write well. Can you just talk to me a little bit about that part of it? Like where did you have to get to to be able to write well about this? So I wrote this for the project started four years after the divorce. And, um, I think that distance was part of what allowed me to see through the fog of, um, those intense emotions that were there at the beginning and, and those intense emotions that are there at the beginning, um, of any kind of traumatic event like this. It's like, it's what allowed me to do this, the the stuff that I look back on and I'm like, why did I go get drinks with them? Right? Like we had the divorces, my divorce was just finalized, maybe, maybe a month or two, maybe three months. And, um, Patrick told me that, uh, the only thing that they were fighting about, we, we would see each other still. And he told me that the only thing that he and Trish were fighting about was me and that um occasionally Trish would would start getting worried about you know what I thought of her and um what she'd done to me and then they'd start fighting and this would drive me crazy when Patrick would tell me this because of course in my mind I was thinking this is just her bad behavior and she's blaming it on me still like I'm out of their life and she's still just blaming it on me and so because I have some sort of or had some sort of twisted logic I was like I know to show Patrick that, and to show Trish that I don't care so that she can stop using me as an excuse. And when she behaves poorly and they get into fights, she's going to have to come up with another reason that 
she's acting the way she's acting. I know I'll go get a drink with them. And it's like, why did I think getting a drink with these two people that I used to get drinks with all the time and suddenly like I'm going to watch her put her hand on his thigh and like him whisper into her ear like it was the most trippy surreal experience and um so all of those like emotions those foggy crazy emotions somehow allowed me to make decisions like that to do that and that was about the same time that I was like I'm gonna write fiction about this and of course I can't write fiction about it or I can't even make sense of it because I'm still in the middle of it even though the divorce is over I'm still like in their weird twisted world like allowing myself to get pulled in and making these decisions that I look back and it's it's like I must have been on drugs I wasn't but it, that's what it feels like it's a memory of that was my body and I can remember exactly where I was sitting at that bar and watching you know the hand go there on the thigh and all of it being like Whoa. um and all of this to say uh by the time I was writing it I was significantly less emotionally attached but the conversations had become more regular in my head that were recurring and they'd also become clearer and it was like these particular memories were just sticking with me and when i wrote them down i did not think that i would be exercising them that was not the intention and yet now seven years away from the divorce, two years having written this, it's like, it's, they're gone. It's like, poof, gone, except when I open up the book and it's wonderful. It's like, I've created this little box and I can open it and be like, yeah, Brad, I remember that one. Yeah. I remember that one really well. And then I yeah. close it and it's just there. And, and I think it makes total sense to me because I love lists. I love lists. And if I write it down, my brain gets to be like, inactive and calm and peaceful but until i've written the thing down that i need to remember i'm like walking around with lists in my head you know i have this thing in the in the middle of the night when i wake up and if i need to remember to like tell a student to buy a book a particular book and a particular student i'll do this whole thing in the middle of the night tell a student tea toothpaste toothpaste when you're brushing your teeth think about the toothpaste and when you're thinking about the toothpaste remember the word t and from t you're going to or the letter t and from t you're going to get to tell well, who are you going to tell something you're going to tell a student what student are you going to tell i do this whole thing in the middle of the night and my boyfriend now is like so there's a reason you don't sleep there's a reason <laughs> like you're not sleeping right. i'm like give me trazodone and i will sleep <laughs> right right or write it so now i keep a little book by the bed I well, that's, I think that's a good, yeah, you externalize it in writing and maybe take it out of your brain. But, you know, I talk about this maybe too much on this show, but I, be, I do believe there is a therapeutic benefit to writing stuff down. I don't know if you write for that purpose. I was just talking with J. Ryan Stradle about this and he, you know, he was sort of like, yeah, you don't go into it thinking that's like the mission, but it sometimes has that effect. And I believe deeply that it's true. Like there's something powerful about sitting with it as long as you have to sit with it to render it into a work of literature and then when it's done after you've gone through that long process it does feel like there's some distance from it it's not that your heart is ever going to be fully the way that it used to be like right there's scar tissue stuff happens yeah. in life we absorb these wounds and they stay with us in some capacity but writing it down in a book and doing that hard labor and that hard emotional labor that it takes to really sit with something like that, it has a healing effect. Absolutely right? agree. Absolutely. A hundred percent. I mean, the only thing now that there are, there are three scenes in here that I did the audio work for this. You did the audio work for your book. Um, yeah. uh, and there were, I think three scenes that were difficult to get through. And um, they're the ones with my dog. My dog is the thing that chokes me up. And El Elmer. Elmer. Elmer T. Lee. He was a very good dog. Um, my dog chokes me up. And uh, there's a there's a chapter in part three. So in the in the part that's most traditionally written. Um, and it's one of the last chapters I wrote, even though it's in the middle. It's it, it doesn't come towards the end because I wrote it 
out of order and I wrote part three out of order and then shuffled them around. But there's um, a very last minute edition. Like I think we'd even gone through the first past pages. And then I ended up putting in this chapter about um, a very, very close mutual friend of mine and Patrick's um, somebody who I just uh, really admire as a, as a human being and, and got very close to, but it was Patrick who brought into our relationship. They knew each other first. Um, and he showed up at a reading of mine literally the day after I found out about the affair and I had taken the train from New York down to politics and prose in DC. And my sister was in the audience. My mom's in the audience. My professors from Virginia are in the audience. Like um, Patrick's cousin, who is eventually going to marry my sister, maybe they were already, they were married by then, um, is in the, is in the audience. So I'm like surrounded by like, Hannah lovers, like people who love me and have supported me. And in comes Patrick's best friend since second grade with a, a newborn, his first newborn and his wife. And these are people who I've known for a decade. And when they brought that little baby up to me at the end of the reading and pulled back the blanket, like, literally couldn't talk. I couldn't talk. Like my mouth didn't open. I couldn't, it was, I mean, it, there was some sort of um, hysterical like panic attack going on in my body. Like I was, and I just shook my head and it was like everything I could do not to like to keep the tears because I'm, you know, people like there's a video of this, right? Like it's oh. being filmed and, and I was just I like, I don't mean I, to laugh. <laughs> no. And, and that is the only passage that like, when I'm reading that passage, um, even talking about it is okay. But when I get to the part, what I'm telling you, Brad, is that I can make myself cry. <laughs> it's like, that's I good. think I'm, you know, that's, I'm a very powerful writer. I can make myself yeah. cry. But when I get to the part where they like pull back the little blanket and I read it and I'm like, well, there's a purity to the dog love that love for Elmer. And there's a purity, I think, it makes a lot of psychological and emotional sense that suddenly in the midst of all this, you're so compartmentalized to be giving a reading and to be you know, on videotape and to be in front of all these people who know you so well, 24 hours, like right in the wake of all this, right? Like the emotional tumult that you were experiencing, I can see how to suddenly come eye to eye <laughs> with a brand new baby like this pure being, you know, it's probably asleep, but just to be looking at it's like sweet little face. I totally get how that could be the thing that undid you. And just like, how do you cope with that? Right. It Everyone was awful. Else you could... Yeah. That, <laughs> that fucking baby. But you know, it's pretty intense. That's a great scene in the book. I'm glad you added it. I think it's like, you know, that last third of the book is where the pathos really sort of becomes three dimensional but I want to talk to you first about creative choices. Cause this is like, I think a lot of the early reviews have noted how this is a formally inventive memoir. Mm -hmm. It is a memoir that in its first chunk is rendered mostly through these dialogues. It's like dialogue only very little expository writing at all. And you sort of set it up almost like a play or like there's like a scene setting and then the dialogue begins. And what I love about this is that it feels tr truest to life. It feels true to how we experience really difficult interpersonal stuff in particular, trauma, um, like this kind of thing, an affair, a betrayal. It's going to be remembered conversations, scenes in your head. Or if you're me, there might be like imagined arguments which this book gets into too. It's like sometimes the, the conversations are remembered and then other times they are speculative. They're like imagined conversations of what you might say if you talk to somebody. That's how the human mind works, right? If you're anything like me, that's how your mind works. Yeah. Yeah. Like you walking around, like having won the lottery, right? And I, I mean, it, it, you're like paralyzed by this lottery that you didn't even win. Like, what are we going to do? You mean do? in my book? Yeah, you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, I know yeah. that you okay. do it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you run these scenes in your head yeah. and you, you know, I remember I do this with politics way too much where I like, I'll have an imaginary debate with somebody and it's like, I always win the debate. Of course, you know, it's like you have these moments where you say just the right thing at just the right time. And then you yes. sort of wake up, you snap out of it. And you're like, Whoa, you know, what, what am I doing? You know, I'm, 
it's very strange, but I think it's very human. I can, um, I can get into some, tr- I love getting into arguments with people, um, who are not in the room with me and I do it mostly in, in the car, um, where I can just like get really fired up. Um, you know, I imagine, and it starts with an imaginary slight, right? My sister has done something. My mother has said something, or if I'm like really looking for a good fight, my boyfriend has said something and I like, you know, I even like, I'll bait him in the conversation where I lead him. Like I guide him to make sure that he says the thing I need him to say. And because, because I know these people really well, and because I'm an asshole writer who lives the majority of her time in her head. Um, I think I have a really keen sense of the world. And I think I have a terrific understanding of the motivations of people. And, and I like, I'm, I'm such an, I'm such an asshole that I think I know people better than they know themselves. Like you should hear my boyfriend just like roll his eyes at me when we get into a fight, which is very rare, but I'm like, and now you're thinking this like a real fight. And he's like, no, Hannah, that's not what I'm thinking. And I'm like, yes, it is. Yes, it is. And sometimes, sometimes he's like, it's really fucking annoying when you do that. And I'm like, because I'm right. Because I'm right. I, I like how you characterize it. You're like, you should hear his eyes roll. Like, you, it's actually audible. <laughs> he's from Decatur, Illinois. And I don't know uh-huh. if you've ever known anyone from Decatur, Illinois, but they I'm from, Indi- can, I'm from Indiana, close enough. They, so. they, get, they are capable of like really scary, like... I'm going to fuck you up bar room. Like not like he's ever, but just the eyes. And you're like, I'm going to walk. I'm going to you know, leave. You know what my Decatur memory is? Or like my associated memory with Decatur, Illinois is the line. The smell of Ferris. cereal. No, it's the, it's the <laughs> line in Ferris Bueller's day off where Ferris is calling Cameron repeatedly to get him to skip school. And Cameron's in bed. And I think he says, my mom's in Decatur. Hopefully she's staying. I remember that line so well. That's, That's a very so guy thing. good. It's so good. <laughs> I love that. So I want to talk to you uh, about some more, like some of the, the interesting dynamics that you had with Patrick and Trish and George and the scene that you were running in that I think serve as kind of complicating factors. The first is that you're all writers, right? Is everybody mm-hmm. a writer? It, who, yeah, George, which one? George, mm-hmm. George is a poet. George is yep. a poet. I was trying to think if he was a writer, but yeah, he's a poet. Mm-hmm. Trish was your MFA friend. Patrick is very competitive with you about writing. Mm-hmm. You guys are all friends. There's a lot of drinking. <laughs> I cannot help but notice in this book. There's a lot of drinking. You guys, there's a lot of drinking. And I, the thing I like about it, here's two things I like about it. First of all, that it's just in there. And there's no real equivocation made or apology. And there's no like redemptive narrative arc where it's like, and now after all this, I'm sober or anything like that. Like you just social drinkers go out and like have a few pops, right? It's in there. That's right. That's right. That's that's true. And, yes. and you know what? That's true for a lot of people. It's certainly true for a lot of writers. But I think when you have the kind of dynamic that plays out ultimately in this friend group, alcohol is probably a complicating factor. Yeah. I mean, of course. Right. Like, and it was a crutch for each of us and for each of us in a different way. For me, the, um, like we could all be our own little archetype, right? Like shy, the shy one, um, the wallflower, uh, the one who's going to drive you crazy because she's always self-deprecating and like, no, you walk on the sidewalk. I'll walk through the mud. Right. Like the me version of back, Like, I wouldn't be able to stand me now. Like, I'd be like, just walk on the fucking sidewalk. Nobody has to walk in the mud. Like, what are you doing? Anyway, so that's me, right? Like, the annoying wallflower who also has to have everything perfect all the time. Like, so I drink to, like, come out of myself and to be fun. Um, And then there's Patrick, who just loves drinking. Um, (laughs) And uh, I think certain boredoms of the world are alleviated and um you know the the inanities of and indignities of existence are kind of lifted and so he's drinking for that potentially maybe i don't know and um trish is drinking maybe for a reason not dissimilar to mine like um you know looking back at it now there must have been 
some kind of insecurity and what I perceive to be just this really easiness with the world and with life. Um, you know, something else was going on for sure. And then, yeah, I think, that, but I do think the men um, had a gravitation towards the alcohol that perhaps was the most potentially dangerous for like their long-term trajectory. Um, but yeah, it, you could trace an evening for us, pretend that we'd gone to New York to see them. There would be like the twilight hour, like lovely, you know, the sun's going down and we're all buzzed and we haven't seen each other. And it's just like, awesome. And then there, and that could last like a couple hours. And then there'd be a shift to another bar and then another bar. And then at some point, Trish would disappear. Like, and then somebody else would say that she's down at this other bar and um, she's mad at me for something I did. So then there's like an introduction of like a slight that occurred that I wasn't even aware of. Um, and at this point, because I'm also the unfun one at this point in every evening, I stop drinking. I'm like, no, nah, I'm done. And I can last with them for maybe another hour once I've stopped drinking, but that's it. Like then I'm done and I tap out. So at this point, Trish has rejoined. George is inarticulate, like that drunk. And then, you know, Patrick's like talking to some stranger, explaining to them like some political nuance or some nuance of a book and making sure that everybody at the bar knows that he's the smartest and they're the dumbest. And I peace out and leave. And I like go home or go back to the hotel or whatever. Um, and then the next morning I hear from Patrick about like, you know, how awful it was or who got into fights after I left. And then um, at about noon, because we'd be visiting, right? Uh, brunch, champagne, museums, art, twilight, awesome fight. Like every single time. That was the cycle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sounds very healthy and functional, right? Not dysfunctional <laughs> at all. No, no, no red flags, right? <laughs> I was so, I'll be honest, I was so tired, man, for somebody who was in their late 20s, early 30s. And I don't mean tired physically. I mean, emotionally, I was so tired of it and I didn't know how to get out of it. And And occasionally I would try to have these really no pun intended, sober conversation, like sober meaning serious here, conversations with Patrick, like we need to cut him out, man. Like when we see them, there is always an epic fight. When we see them, you and I start fighting. When we see them, like I come home and I feel like my liver is like, like wilting. Like I feel like we look sick. We act sick. Like we need to stop. And there was that was just never an option for him. And um, I loved him so much that I, I, I let it continue until I think he got us out of it, this marriage, the only way that any of us could. And I am, I remain grateful that it was not just a betrayal, but a betrayal with her because it was, it was immediate. It wasn't, we can work it out. I just knew. I was like, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. You did the thing that we all need. Like you blew it up, man. Like, fuck yeah. Let's get out. Let's start life number two, right? Like we all have so many lives. That's why we're writers. We, we play it out. We fantasize. We speculate. We get into other people's brains. Like I got a do over in real life. And, and I was still young enough that, you know, there's some elastic elasticity left in my skin and like right. and, and but your, I was and also your brain. <laughs> and in my brain and I was also old enough that it meant something right like I'm not going to do that again I am changes will be made and I am going to appreciate this new still not sober life right like I, I have not found sobriety and I don't want to um but like I have found this great appreciation of just being like myself and as long as i'm not hurting anyone like i'm not gonna walk in the mud i'm gonna walk on the sidewalk right like it's just it's not a bad it's not bad to like in your mid-30s to actually have a wake-up call and get a get a do-over like a get out of jail free card is how i always thought about it 
Well, yeah, and especially when things are as sideways as they got with this marriage and with this group of friends. <clears throat> and, you know, I have to say again, the way that it is portrayed, the way that it was, at least from your perspective, as written is often funny, even as it's like <laughs> dark and upsetting. And that's to your credit, because I think that's the way life often is. And there is also something, if I may use this term, kind of incestuous about it all. We've already talked about the intimacy among the friends and how you guys were always going out. And, you know, you were like a team almost. But then on top of it, Patrick, who's quite a character, <laughs> had this ex-girlfriend, Holly, who you would run into and who would come to your house and like steal booze. She was an addict and yeah. she was around like she was around to a degree that one's significant other's ex often is not around in a relationship. And so I think this is part of the dysfunction <laughs> interpersonally, like just with the group, it's another extension of the dysfunction, but it's also, I think part of the personal dysfunction that you eventually learn to recognize in yourself this thing about not walking in the mud, tolerating the fact that Holly's just like coming over, <laughs> like, you know, keeping what, keeping clothes at your house and like taking your booze and God knows what, but like, right. Am I, yeah. on the, am I characterizing yeah, it, this in a way that you agree with? It's, it's, it's perfect. And, and, and it's funny because I've never thought of it this way before, but hearing you describe it makes me feel like I was indoctrinated into a cult, like, because it was always, my my perspective of it like i think it's strange that we don't lock the front door and she just walks in and that she's still keeping clothes in the closet that's next to our bedroom like i think it's strange that one day i walk downstairs to use the bed bathroom and like i'm naked and she's coming in the front door like but but it was always i'll never i think i include this in the book i'm not sure but like his main complaint with me even when we were together and you can imagine how this just like that I lacked imagination and that like I was, I was some sort of like bourgeois, like freak that I had to, that, that everything had to have categories, like that an ex-girlfriend had to be an ex-girlfriend. And he would always say, I've stayed in touch with every one of my ex-girlfriends. And like, meanwhile, me, my ex-boyfriends, where are they? Who the fuck knows? Like, <laughs> that is not me. Like pew, life. Nope. That was good. That was awesome. We learned something from each other. Goodbye. Like, but he, he was in touch with all of his ex-girlfriends. I've had dinner with every single one of his ex-girlfriends. Like, why? Why, man? Isn't that weird? But they, they made me feel like I was the bourgeois freak and I bought into it. And like, <laughs> I, I hope Holly comes across as like, as compelling and like terrifying as she was to me. Cause she was also older and, um, she was a musician. She, she, you know, played music on the downtown mall in Charlottesville. And she just had, she had this, like, she oozed charisma. Like she should have been famous. You know how they talk about um, some of the famous rock stars that, that, that you're just like, you want to fall on the floor, apparently and, like start having sex with them. You're a perfectly normal person, but you're in a room with them and you're like, I don't care. Right. Take my baby. Like, I don't care. I love you forever. She right. had that kind of quality, which also just freaked me out. Like, cause with the, with the drugs and the drinking and like, you know, Roman Roy, do you watch succession? No, I don't. Uh, I'm so bad at TV. I'm, okay. I'll watch it. In like it's okay. Five don't years. waste your life. Don't, it, but there's an actor who's just, he's one of the Cal Macaulay Culkin brothers. He's one of the Macaulay Culkin. Culkin is last Ke name. Kieran Culkin. Yeah. He's that one. He like the way he kind of worms across furniture every time i see him he's a beautiful actor as far as like what he does with his body it always reminds me of her she could just like she'd walk into a bar and she'd somehow like be on it and near it and like across the bar like grabbing someone else's drink and like you know her hand up someone's it was she was just like tentacled and um fascinating and so and she and she got to be like the the ex-girlfriend who is just like always there. And I'm like, Hannah, the straight one. Like hmm. I'm rigid yeah, Hannah. It's, it's not exactly the same, but I remember feeling much the same way, like in a kind of, in a kind of different sense when I was in college and I would be with my friends and we would be like on drugs and I would be like, <laughs> I would be like, wow, shit is weird. Or like, this is fucked up. Or like, Hey guys, look, there's a cop or, you know, and they'd be like, 
And I went to Boulder and everyone was like, dude, why aren't you just, why can't you just mellow out? And I'd be like, mellow out? Like I just took like two hits of acid. I'm supposed to <laughs> mellow out? Like, like, like I was, I was constantly the guy who like wasn't mellow enough. And I'm just like, dude, like it just seemed disingenuous to me. And I felt, uh, I internalized that. I felt like there was something wrong with me because I couldn't, it was like, the, it was like some sort of like contest to see who could act like they had taken nothing. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I was like, we, we just took stuff on purpose. So why are we trying to act like we didn't take anything? Like, you know, but my anxiety, yeah. I, I have, I'm like the happiest pessimist you'll ever meet. And I have really high anxiety that I don't treat deliberately because it, I channel it into my writing and I, I greatly enjoy my anxiety for the most part. Um, and the people who love me tolerate it for the most part, but I've, tr I've tried drugs, like obviously, and it just, it makes, they make me feel stupid. And then like, I want to tell people how stupid they make me feel. Um, like while I'm on them, especially pot, I'm like, yeah. And I, I want to get quiet because I know the minute I open my mouth, I'm like, that's the dumbest thing that's ever been said. And yeah. it just makes me so anxious. Yeah, I'm the same way. I mean, I, th I think it, uh, with age too, like, I don't know how, there are some people I think who are wired and can take cannabis and it's like, just like an accentuator almost. They just are basically normal, but a little happier or something. But for me, I turn into the most boneheaded, thoughtless version of myself and completely useless mm -hmm. socially. So it's like, I don't even, you know, there's no point for me unless right. every once in a while, you know, like, but not, it's not something I enjoy all that much. Yeah. And I want to talk, or I actually, you know what, before we get any further, I, I want to actually have you read again, because there's a section of the book where you're interacting with Holly, your ex-husband's ex-girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that the dynamic there is so interesting. And I also think, it, you know, this is sort of how the reader in your book learns, one of the ways the reader learns that this marriage is not worth keeping for many reasons, but it's the way you start to get information that maybe you're not on the right journey. So just read this section where you're with Holly, maybe set it up a little bit and then. Yeah. So, um, she shows up occasionally in the book, sometimes in certain scenes, um, it's when she's still in a relationship with Patrick. Um, and then at this point, this very brief scene, it's after they've split up um, and a few months have gone by and Patrick and I started seeing one another. And for some reason that I'm sure made sense to us at the time, but now looking back, I'm like, what was that about? We decided not to tell anybody. We didn't, um, we didn't want anyone to know. And I think part of it was, there was a lot of pressure like coming from Trish and George, y'all should be together. Like you're best friends and you see each other all the time and you're always playing Scrabble and his parents loved me. And I think we were both enough, like let's not give the people what they want kind of people um, that when we started hooking up, we're like, let's just not have them set the wedding bells just yet. Right. Like, um, so we were really secretive about it. And uh, like, Holly is not an idiot, obviously, like people are not idiots. Like, uh, obviously, we, just, we started acting differently. So I run into her, I'm on my way to work. Um, <clears throat> and I run uh, waiting tables and I run into her where she's playing music on the downtown mall. So April 2007, Hannah runs into Holly on the downtown mall. Holly is leaning against the exterior brick wall of the Paramount Theater. She's playing a washboard. There are bottle caps on her fingers. At her feet is a fawn-colored boxer, and beside the boxer is a box full of puppies, a squirming mass of brindles and solids. There's a handwritten sign, pups, $250 each. When Holly sees Hannah, she stops playing. Holly, you, hey you, come here. Hannah, I can't talk, I'm on my way to work. Look, it's like, my mom told me, don't talk to strangers. I'm like, do not talk to her, she's crazy. <laughs> Hannah, I can't talk, I'm on my way to work. Holly, want a puppy? Hannah, you're selling them to anyone? Holly, pick one up. They're warm. Hannah, nah, thanks though. Holly, you and Patrick are together. Hannah, we're friends. Holly, you don't have to lie to me. Hannah, I'm not lying. Holly, you'll end up paying for everything. Hannah, I don't know what you're talking about. 
Holly, he'll use you and then dump you. We went through my inheritance in a year. Hannah, we're not together like that. Holly, I don't get it. You're not his type. Hannah, okay. Holly, you're so nice. Hannah, thanks. Holly, I don't mean it as a compliment. Hannah, right. Holly, he puts bourbon in his coffee in the morning. You ready for that? Hannah. Holly, he likes wild girls. He likes girls like me. He likes a girl he can fix. He needs to be needed. Hannah, got it. Holly, but I got old. Hannah, you're not old. Holly, I'm 10 years older than you. Hannah, I guess. Holly, nobody got me for my 40th. He got me one of those battery-operated face scrubbers. You know what I'm talking about? Did he tell you? I died laughing. He thought I could scrub a decade off my face for my 40th birthday. That's what he gave me. You ready for that kind of romance? Hannah, like I said, I need to get to work. (laughs) So, as rendered on the page, Patrick calls to mind for me the uh, Jeff Daniels character in The Squid and the Whale. Like some iteration of that. Like the, like the, he's such a writer, like the writer dude, you know, but also like, I don't think the Jeff Daniels character was a drinker. It's like that guy with all of his insecurities and intensities, but on top of it, he's like a, a real boozer. I feel Wicked's, like he was a drinker. I think he might've been a drinker. Cause, he might've been, might've yeah, been. Yeah. I'm sure he was. I mean, it's like, yeah. he's got how the beard and how could you not be? It's like part right. of the, it's part of the package, but you know, I, I should say too, like wicked smart and skilled at like psychological warfare as rendered on the page. Like some of the arguments he would have and the way that he would engage in that level of combat. I was just like, Whew, you know, like, okay, that's a tough person to argue with. And he's brilliant. He's brilliant. He's, he's yeah. just a brilliant guy. And so there's an element of competition because I think you are the more successful writer in terms of publication, or at least you got to the mark first. And I think you write that when you sold your first novel, the first thing out of his mouth was, what does this mean for me? (laughs) Which is so telling. I'll never forget that either. We were at a coffee shop and um, I had to go wait tables and it was supposed to be like the most exciting day of my life. Like an auction was going on. My, my agent set up this auction. It was a Friday. No, it was a Thursday. I know it was a Thursday. It was raining outside. Um, and we didn't get internet connection. We were living for free at my mom's farm because we were so broke. And we came into town so that I could check my emails as my agent was sending me offers. And before I had to go like literally wait tables at four o'clock, and we moved from a couple different coffee shops over the course of the afternoon. And I was getting these phone calls like, okay, we got an offer, $10,000, like that's the opening offer. And like, you know, I'm broke, broke up to my elbow, like $10,000. I'm like, sell it now, sell it now. And he's like, that's the first offer. Um, And so it was like the most, it's, it's the stuff of life, right? Like, and in this way, if I made this fiction, somebody would say it, that's too perfect. I don't believe it. Like, it's just too perfect. It happened this way. It is the, up until now, like the highlight of my career. It is like everything, all of my dreams have been about since I started writing, like literal dreams. When I sleep, I am dreaming of getting a contract. I'm dreaming of having an agent. It is happening to me on this rainy Thursday in Charlottesville. Meanwhile, my glum fuck boyfriend is like with me on all of these stops. And every time I get up to take a phone call from my agent, he's like, you can just see his body language getting more like, (laughs) do you have to take another phone call now? Like, do you have to do it now? And so when, when they finally stopped bidding right before I went to work, it's like three 30 and we're at a different coffee shop close to where I can walk to work now. Um, I get the offer and I'm like, well, they've stopped bidding. It's three houses. I get to make the choice, but no one's going to go higher. And he went, what does this mean for me? You're just going to leave me in the dirt. You're just going to leave me in the dirt. And I'm like, 
we're not married, right? Like now, I at the time, I was like, no, don't like, what are you talking about? Like our life is together. I love you. This means nothing. But now I'm looking back at that and I'm like, what do you mean? What does it mean to you? Like, I'm t- we're 29. Like who the, f- you don't want to marry me. Like you can barely stay in at night. Like you want to be drinking at bars all the time. And I have to beg you like, but instead, you know, he just like the way that he could make it about him. And, you know, again, I take a lot of credit here because no one was making me stay like seated next to him at the, you know, at the couch. And if I'd been like in the coffee shop and if I'd been remotely honest with a single person in my like family, like my brother, my sister, my mom, all of whom I deeply respect and admire and whose advice like is always spot on. If I had told any of them about any of these behaviors, they would have like had an intervention. They would have been like, but, but I was so secretive, so, so secretive and never, never, ever, um, like told people what was going on. And so, um, on this same day that I've like got this career high, I'm also, um, you know, caretaking and like comforting and like apologizing, like I apologized. And, and then when we finally did get to celebrate, you know, he just, he got, he got drunk and it was mopey and it was like, just the worst it just sucked i wish i could go back and like stand up for yourself yeah yeah Yeah. or you know if like some if some other young person reads this book and like stands up for themselves like just one it's like worth it right and yet just to (laughs) be nuanced about it to be in a to be a writer in a relationship with another writer and you're both fighting to get anywhere you're like at both it's got to be difficult for the other person like i wonder if like if he had had the big break i imagine you probably would have handled it much better but it's still got it's got to be difficult i've never been in that situation but if like your significant other is doing the same thing that you are and they start to break out and you're just like left and i can understand the emotional feeling of that but i think a more grown-up person would understand that that's just like a feeling and that you, you put that to the side. It, I, it must've been devastating for him. Um, and I know that as, as the relationship went on, got more serious, we got married and the first book led to a second book to a third. Like, I know that was like killing him. I know it was killing him. And, um, I'm sure that no matter how many times I or his agent or somebody else said, what you're working on is brilliant. You're a brilliant writer. That doesn't matter, right? Um, It just feels like somebody apologizing and making excuses. And so I I do think that our shared interests, um, we would have needed to be two, two different people in order to, to make, to make that kind of, competition not a competition right like um it just i i I, yeah i must i'm i I can only imagine that by the end it felt to him like i was making his writing and his self-worth impossible like that 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 i was part of the problem Uh, in the same way that for me he was becoming part of the problem as well um and like i say in the book i start i really started privileging um our marriage as fodder for material like i he wanted to fight i didn't care i'd be like great let's i'm gonna get some sound bites out of this one because like you're (laughs) a lot you're really smart and i try to make you smart when i'm writing about you um but this is even better if i can like write exactly what you say you know so um, did you did you feel competitive towards him like was there was that part of what fueled you to writing success and publishing success where you're like i'm gonna outdo this guy like did you have that No, but does that make me sound like I'm like, no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. And part of it is maybe because I had the book deal first. Um, and I had the first, you know, I I had a first published story. So, um, and I think this is where we get into the complexity of people. I've talked about myself as like this shy wallflower, but I also have like this enormous, um, like I'm also like really confident about this one aspect. I know that I can write. And when I was, when I was in grad school, like 
and this is what I do. Like, this is what I, I wake up and I sleep and I eat and I breathe and I think about, and it's why I'm only 50% invested in any relationship. Cause this is my, this is my fucking life. And, um, and he also had music, he had music and like writing was something that he also enjoyed. And he, like, he, he's also, you know, he had like scholarly tendencies. I didn't have that. I had one thing. And so I never felt competitive towards him. And that's not to say like, I didn't think he was talented, but like, no, I just, I was like, this is my thing and I'm good at it. And if, if I get rejected, it doesn't mean I'm not good at it. It just means I have to keep trying harder. Um, and like, by the way, along the way with, with all of those, the books that were published, there were major lows with books that I wrote, lost an agent over, switched to a new agent um, that never got published. And so I was having my own career lows and, you know, my debut with this awesome 10 house auction, it didn't sell like it was supposed to sell. And um, so then I became like this, you know, author who'd made too much money on the first one and then basically went back to this like, ooh, tainted goods kind of thing. And like, I feel every single book that I'm still like clawing my way out of the hole of having had a chance to um, be like a breakout and missed it, that I missed it. And so no, I just, no, I never felt competitive towards him. So, and you do, I think one of the things that's worth noting about this book is the fact that you, that, you know, you're taking a scalpel to, the whole situation and to everybody involved, including yourself. And a line that I underlined that you, or a couple of lines where <clears> you're <throat> kind of assessing yourself is you say, my, and you just alluded to this, my own way of being virtually, my own way of being virtually precludes a successful relationship. I'm morbidly secretive, but I expect unmitigated honesty and complete transparency from everyone else. <laughs> So morbidly secretive. Aren't you? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I am. And I think the reason that I, I have a successful relationship right now is because he knows that and he understands why I need it. And he, why do you need it? Okay. That's a really good question. Um, So I, th I had a therapist for a little while and I think they would say I have trust issues and that that like, and she might've said it and that would be a bad thing. And it's like, I hear you have trust issues and I'm like, yes, that seems like a very safe and healthy way to navigate this like fucked up dog eat dog world. Like that is correct to me, but also like, I don't want to share. I don't want to share everything. I want some shit just to be mine. Like, ew, gross. Like, fuck, no. Like, right. Just, I, I mean, I'm I'm rendered inarticulate here, but um, because it makes me feel happy to have secrets and like it. I also think I've, I, I said earlier that I think I have a really great understanding of other people and I spend a lot of time trying to understand their motivations. I guess there's part of me that m must believe that by holding back a certain amount, I am ultimately unknowable, that I am describable and um, lovable, <laughs> but like ultimately unknowable. And why is that important? I have no idea, but it makes like, it makes my body and my brain feel better. Hmm. Safer. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, this book covers so much ground. I cannot part company with you without at least touching upon the fact that one element of the personal narrative that you're delivering in this book has to do with your relationship with food, which has been an issue, uh, in your life for, what, since you were a teenager, you go yeah. back to the beginning, I believe yeah. when you were, so, and you sort of uncover like the, it's interesting that moment you've kind of like dialed it all the way back to like the, what's the word, like the original moment. It's like the origin began. story. 
Yeah, that's what I yeah. mean. Yeah, the origin story of like this, you know, battle with food and bulimia. And it's just another component of, I don't know, Hannah making her way through early adulthood, getting to know herself, the struggles we all have. If it's not that, it's something else, right? Like we all have our stuff, but it's a big part of this book. And I think it it's related somehow. Right. Well, it's also me not asking for help, right? Like, um, in the same way that I made sure that my family had no idea what was going on before I was married. And then once I was married, it was like lockdown. Everything was to, I, life was wonderful. Life is great. It, It was just like a lockdown. And occasionally, you know, my sister would get these whiffs and towards the very, very end, like I'd go on a run with my brother and he would say things like, you know, divorce isn't a terrible idea. And I'd be like, what, why would you even talk about divorce? And he'd be like, you know, sometimes we talk when you're not in the room about how Patrick talks to you. And I'm like, Patrick loves me. And they're like, yeah, you know, you you could see them sort of like tiptoeing towards me. And in the same way, um, once, once the body dysmorphia kicked in and, um, the eating, like first the control of eating with anorexia and then um, the shame for me, the shame of bulimia, like um, as though I was doing something wrong. Right. And in fact, the one time, the one time my mother um, was on to me, she got a phone call from my brother who was in college at the time. And I was home from boarding school. And I remember like there's this 7am phone call and I was like, it's Saturday and it's seven. And my mom comes storming into my bedroom and she's like, that was your brother on the phone. And I, I, I'm thinking my brother's dead, right? Not dead, but like, there's bad news. Like what's wrong? Is everything okay? Is my dad dead? Like what has happened? And she's like, you puke, you're a puker. And she made, she got me out of bed and she made me stand on a scale. And at, at the time I was such a, cynical already so cynical and so um separated like from body and brain and from actual circumstances i remember already as this scene was playing out with my mother kind of like sitting back you know the armchair me in my armchair and my brain being like weighing me isn't going to prove anything like this is <laughs> like this is the stupidest thing in the world while also like in a different armchair up there i'm like oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, she's found out I've done something bad. And my mom and I have talked about this and she would undo it and do it over in a million different ways. So for anybody listening who's like, that's really bad parenting, um, she she regrets it. But in that moment, I was already so full of shame for what I was doing, even as I couldn't stop doing it. Um, but then her, the way she approached me with this accusation, right? Like as opposed to, if you found out your kid was doing heroin or something, you'd be like, honey, we're going to get you help. We're going to get you help. It doesn't matter. We're going to get you help. It doesn't matter. I was like, nope, I didn't. I'm not a puker. I'm not a puker. I'm not a puker. And like up there, the Hannahs are warring. And then one of them says, my mom's like, well, then what are you? And I was like, Dad had vodka. He had vodka out and I did a shot of vodka and I felt so sick to my stomach that I ran to the bathroom because I don't like alcohol and I vomited it all up. And, you know, dad's friend must have walked in on me afterwards, right after I had that vodka. And my mom's response was, your father had alcohol in the house. I'm like 16 and I didn't drink. Like I wasn't a drinker and I hadn't had vodka, but her response was so immediate and it was to blame my father and that it was alcohol. And I remembered, again, being up there, like, in my head, being like, how stupid is she? Like, <laughs> what? Like, I literally eat boiled onions for breakfast. Like, what? Of course I'm a puker. And I got away with it. And that was the closest. And I, and even the way I talk about it still, right? Like, I sound like I, I've stolen something from a convenience store. Like, I got away with it. Like, fucking help the girl who weighs nothing like you know like who's like eating um one of those rice cakes like rice cakes were my delicacy especially if i occasionally had them with the that nasty powdered like parmesan like 
whoa, that was like a meal for a couple days right there. Oh my God. But, but yeah. And, and I think it was all about not asking for help, needing to be, to appear to be completely put together and okay. And like, I am in control and life is good. It's, it's the same, it's the same thing. And, and now I will say like the secrecy that I have now, I do not perform like I'm okay. Like that's not this, that's, that's not the secret part. Like I am a legit happy person. I let my, my crazy show, like everybody understands who is close to me now. Like I love talking about the really dark, crazy stuff that goes on in my head. And I am so lucky and grateful that I have a boyfriend who I'm like, dude, this meal makes me want to vomit. So we're going to have to hang out here for a little while on the couch. And like, just, you probably want to not leave the room for a little while. Cause like, if you did, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty secretive and it's great. Like, and I don't feel ashamed by it. And he just, you know, it is funny. He was, um, he reread it just when it came out in hardback and he was, <laughs> it's like really funny and surreal. He was reading it in bed next to me while I was reading Heartburn by Nora Ephron. And, uh, so he's reading this and every once in a while he's laughing and I'd be like, what, it, which, which part are you laughing at? What part are you laughing at? And when he got to that line that you just read, um, about being like so secretive, he starts going, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what line? What line? He was like, mm -mm. Mm -mm. I'm not going to tell you. And I was like, ha, ha, ha. but it was really funny. Like, he's like, you do know yourself very well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's gotta be, I mean, it's an interesting book to have your significant other read like after the, I guess he knows the, the most of the story anyway, but yeah, that's gotta be somebody who knows you well and gets you. And that's great. You deserve that, especially in the aftermath of what you've been through. This is uh, one of those books that you sort of tear through. I wrote down here, there's, I call it the wincing slash whistling effect. There's lots of like this where you're like, Ooh, you know, like the kind of like that thing where you're reading. I love and just that. Like, oh my God. There's lots of moments like that, you know, where you're just sort of like wincing in pain. Like you're feeling it as the reader on behalf of Hannah in the book. And then maybe like, wow, whistling and being like, she said it like there's a lot of really bracing candor and you have a lot of courage uh, as a writer kind of going in there and it's what makes the book succeed. So congratulations to you for enduring all this and then finding a way to render it in art. I think it will be helpful to people or I don't know, titillating and interesting and fascinating, but in particular, I think helpful to people who may have dealt with, some kind of ruptured intimate relationship. And I'm glad that you wrote it. I imagine you feel better having written it. And I wish you well in this new relationship and with all that you have going. So thank you. I forgot Brad. to ask you, are you, are you working? Yeah. Are you working on another book? <laughs> I always, it feels like maybe especially rude to ask that after this one, but I, I always ask people if they have something else in the pipeline. Is it the case? Um, I'm working on a book that the, the announcement's coming out. I haven't finished it. The announcement should come out soon, but it's, um, about a writer named Hannah. It's auto fiction. It's about a writer named Hannah. Um, it's a comedy, dark, dark comedy about, um, the writer Hannah who finds out that her ex-husband is publishing his debut novel and the debut novel is about, uh, the dissolution of their marriage. Um, and then like, meanwhile, on the, on the eve of finding that out, like her extended family is starting to move to town to this small Midwestern town in Kentucky. Um, and so it is, it's like hilarity and, um, psychological anxiety ensue. So you're going to get another book out of this. That's interesting. Maybe it'll be a trilogy, <laughs> but I well, like that. It's like looking at it. It's like a prismatic thing. You're like looking at it from another angle, right? Or like exploring these themes in this subject matter a bit more, but from a different perspective. And you found a way into fiction with it after having done the memoir. And I found a way into fiction. So, yeah. Well, I'll be excited for that one. And uh, truly congratulations and all the best. This was great. Thank you so much. I loved this conversation. Thanks, Brad.